Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. We began talking about this in the book of Genesis, and we, we saw that God created man first, and then God put man in a garden, gave him an, an instruction not to disobey his word concerning a certain tree. The tree is not important. As a matter of fact, Adam did not disobey God by picking a fruit. He disobeyed God when they both ate and picked. And so doing, they break the word of God. Disobedience is not necessarily the action. It is the breaking of a command. And when they did that, they committed high treason. Adam committed high treason. And even though Eve was responsible for it, God did not call her first. He called the man. Because the man was created first, which means he had more knowledge than his wife, and his responsibility was to teach his wife the commandment of God. If you read it very carefully in the book of Genesis, chapter 2, you'll find that the Lord created man, put him in the garden, and said to him, do not eat of the tree of the garden, I mean of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then he created woman, and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply, subdue and have dominion. Adam's responsibility was to teach his wife the commandment of God. And that's the first responsibility of any man. That's God's perfect will. That's his original will. And he still wants it. The man in the home is responsible for being the spiritual head of the home. To instruct the wife and the children through example and teaching the word of God. After Adam and Eve committed high treason, and it is treason because they were given the stewardship of the earth. God trusted them with it, and they turned it over to the devil. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, Whomsoever you obey, his servant you become. The minute they obeyed the devil, they became his servants. Previously, they were his, they were his lords. They were in charge of the earth. They were dominating everything. But when they disobeyed God and obeyed the devil, they became servants of the devil. And so the devil then took on the authority as being the God of this world. And he did it by stealing. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we find the, word, the words, The God of this world has blinded the eyes of all men, lest they see the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and are saved. The devil is referred to as the God of this world because of that transfer of power. Jesus one time when he was in the wilderness being tempted, Satan came to him and threw a challenge that he could not deny. Satan says, if you worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world and all of their power and glory and wealth. Now who made the kingdoms? Jesus. Who owned the wealth? Jesus. But the devil says, I can give it to you. And he was right. Jesus did not argue with it because he was speaking the truth. He had it, but he got it by illegal means, but he still got it. If somebody broke into your house and steal your radio, no matter how much you say it's yours, they still got it. No matter how they got it, they got it. It is you who are not listening to the radio. So you can swear that it's yours and claim it's yours, but once they got it, they got it. And so Jesus knew the devil was speaking the truth. And he said to the devil, well, I can't argue with you, but one thing, I'm going to worship God. And him only will I serve. As soon as Adam and Eve messed up, then they committed treason, God came walking in the garden. Of course, that was Jesus. The Bible says the word of the Lord came walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Words don't walk. But we know from the book of John chapter 1 that in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the same was in the beginning with God, the same was God and is God. And all things were made by the word, but it was not anything made that is made. And in verse 14 it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who was walking in the garden that day? Jesus. He was around long before his name. <laughs> 
And as he walked through the garden, the Bible says he cried out, Adam, where are you? Adam, of course, wasn't lost. You can't be lost from God. David says, even in hell, he can see me. You can't hide behind a bush to hide from God. So the question God asked had nothing to do with him not being able to see Adam. He was, it was a question of disposition. Adam, what went wrong? Where are you in life? Something went wrong. Where are you? And God is asking that question to husbands today. Where are you? Well, God, I'm sitting in my house. Mm -mm, that's not what I mean. Where are you in your relationship to me? Something went wrong, Sonny. And Adam did the most logical thing a person does after they sin. He blamed his wife. The first result of sin is irresponsibility and fear. When somebody becomes afraid, they want to transfer the responsibility. The Bible says he was afraid and he said, this woman. God turned to the woman and said, what is this that you have done? She said, the serpent. She transferred the responsibility. The most irresponsible people in the world are sinners. They destroy their bodies and say they're having a good time. That's irresponsible. They beat their wives, curse their husbands, and say they're having submission. That's irresponsibility. And so we go on blaming even today. Every time somebody is a product of a broken home, they blame the other person. It's never them. It's never them. Well, that is a spirit of sin. God, therefore, saw what had happened to his precious plan. And right away, in the third chapter of Genesis, he cried out, That's okay. I'm going to send the seed of a woman. And he will bruise the serpent's head. And he shall bruise his heel. And then it says that the woman shall be the kind of person who will bear in pain and sorrow children. There will be sicknesses and sorrow and, and depression in the earth. There will be brokenness in the earth. And there was. I believe one of the most difficult things for us to understand is that sickness and disease is connected to sin. When people get sick, they normally say God is doing it. But that's a lie. There was no sorrow in the garden. There weren't even any thorns in the garden. The Bible says, from now on the earth shall bring forth thorns and thistles. But what was it bringing forth before that? Probably cotton and sponge. Nice things. Probably the rose bush had cotton buds on it instead of thorns. But sin has to be expressed in nature. I believe in the Garden of Eden, animals like lambs used to sleep on lions. But when sin came, the lion turned into a terror. And now lions like lamb chops. <laughs> but the day will come, the Bible says, when the heavens and the earth shall be renewed and the lion shall lay down once again with the lamb. Even the animals, the dogs, the vicious Dobermans are influenced by demonic spirits. The next time you are stuck with a thorn, just say to yourself, Adam, wait till I get there. I'm going to have a talk with you. And so we find the Lord's plan beginning. He called a man named Abraham and he said to Abraham, I like you because you are a man who will keep your home. You will teach your children the word of God. You will instruct your family and your servants the word of God. God liked Abraham because Abraham was a priest in his own house, not because he was famous outside. Let's look at Genesis for a moment, chapter 18. In Genesis chapter 18, and I want you to read this very carefully. This is something I must continually remind myself of. This is God's 
expectation of a man that he likes. God says in verse 17, Then the Lord said, Shall I hide anything from Abraham about what I'm about to do in the earth? No, Abraham will surely become a great and powerful man and nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. Through him, because I know Abraham. Now what does God know about Abraham? He says, I like him, I'm going to use him, I'm going to tell him secrets because I know him. What does God know about him? He tells us, I know that he will teach his children and his household to keep the word and commandments of God. And he will teach them what is right and just. And in so doing, the Lord will see to it that the promises he made will come to Abraham. Now let me sh share something with you men and women. The promises of God are linked to the family unit of God. God says the promises I made to Abraham are contingent upon his teaching his family the word. Many of us want God's promises. God has promises prosperity, he's promised us salvation, he's promised us healing, he's promised us joy, he's promised us peace, he's promised us harmony, he's promised us life, all these promises in the word of God. But yet God says, you will get the promise because you teach your children. A lot of men want to prosper, but they don't want to teach the children the word of God. A lot of men want to prosper, but they don't want to teach their wives the word of God. And so, instead of prospering God's way, they go take shortcuts. And they get involved in illegal gain. Of course, the Bible says, he that make haste to be rich will be suddenly cut off. And so Abraham was liked by God because he was a faithful teacher in his family. Most of the time, wives are dropped off to church by their husbands. Apparently, Abraham had a church in his house. That's a real daddy. The scripture says there in that passage that even his servants were taught the word. The ladies who came to clean for him had to come to his devotions. <laughs> the men who mowed the lawn had to come to his devotions. They couldn't work for him unless they came to his devotions, unless they believed what he believed. How's your home, father? Young man, are you qualified to get married? Are you able to teach a woman the word of God? The wife's husband is a man who instructs his family in the word of God. A lot of people get married simply to have license to go to sleep together. That's ungodly. It's not righteous. God intends for the home to be the foundation of society. You know, it's funny that God did not create a church first. He created a family first. As a matter of fact, God didn't create a marriage first. He created a single first. Some of us want to get married and we haven't learned to be single yet. <laughs> Are you listening? Some of us can't wait to get married because we can't handle singleness. Adam was a single man first and he was so totally single and so totally fulfilled that God had to remind him that he was in need of a mate. Are you that single yet? Where you are so consumed by God's will that you don't need to go look for a wife or a husband? You're so much wrapped up in God's righteousness that everything else just goes out of focus. All you see is Jesus. Until Jesus have to come to you and say, Hey buddy, it's about time for you to get a wife. He'll have to disturb you to get you married. Are you that single yet? There are a lot of married people who are having problems because they've never learn to be single God said to Abraham I like you 
and I'm going to tell you secrets. You want the Lord to tell you secrets? What's the qualification for him telling you secrets? He says, I know him. I'll hide nothing from him because he teaches his family the word of God. The wife's husband is a serious guy. We went through the Old Testament and we saw where the Lord continued to command the man to teach the children the word, to bind it around their necks, to talk about it at the table, to talk about it when they get up in the morning, when they go to bed at night, when they walk along the way. Teach your family the word, keep the word in the home. God commands the man to teach the family the word. He did not say, Father, send your children to the Sunday school teacher. He did not say, drop your wife off to church and let the preacher teach her. The Bible says, husband, you teach her. Paul was referring to the man's responsibility when he said, women, if you have questions in the church about God, go home and ask your husbands. That's what he said. Most women can't find their husbands to ask them. And when they do find them, the husband don't know nothing about the word of God. And so the women are wandering around aimlessly, and that's why a lot of women get caught up in cults. A lot of them get caught up in these error doctrines and, and following strange leaders because they don't have no real man at home to tell them what is truth and what is not. How sad. Some men got the audacity, the audacity to say to God, your salvation is for sissies. Could you imagine the creator of the universe, the one who made the hair on your head and under your nose? You say to him, your stuff is for sissies. You are just barely saying that because of his grace. The Bible says, if the righteous scarcely be saved, where? Will the wicked stand? Brother, <laughs> I just made it in glory. Man, I am so appreciative to God. I'm always kissing his toe. <laughs> Constantly kissing his toe. And some folks got the audacity to say, Christianity is for women. But that's all right. Heaven will just be filled with a lot of women. Hell will be filled with a lot of males. But as for me in my house, we checking in to heaven. <laughs> Glory to God. Christianity is for people with guts. It doesn't take a man, a real man, to say yes to a cigarette. It takes a real one to say no. Because there are more people smoking than are not smoking. It takes more guts to refuse a drink than it does to accept one. And yet we say, you have to be jelly back to be a Christian. Folks who have no backs are sinners. They bow to everything. They have no backs. Is this a man? A man who wakes up in the morning and is controlled by a little bottle of liquor. Is that a man? You've got a six foot three man being led around by a little bottle. Is that a man? Tell me. You've got a great big muscular dude with hair all around his face and under his arms. Smells like a bear, but he's led around by a leaf from the cocoa plant. Is that a man? He can hit his wife, curse his children, kick the dog, crash the car. But yet, when the cocaine leaf says, come here, he bows. Is that a man? You tell me. It takes a real man to face life and say no to destruction and follow righteousness. It takes a real man to swim upstream, not downstream. When you come to Jesus, you have turned around and you are swimming against the tide. And you and I know you need more strength 
and energy and power to swim against the tide. Anybody could float downstream. Young man, young woman, it takes a real gutsy person to say no. Everybody is sleeping and shocking up, not me. It takes guts to do that because everybody else is doing it. We got this weird conception that if you want to prove yourself to be a real man, you've got to have some extra concubines. And if you don't have an extra concubine on the side, then you're not a real man in society. You know what that shows? That shows that you have no guts to be faithful to your wife. That shows weakness. It takes a real man to be a Christian. The wife's husband's supposed to be a priest. One who teaches his home. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. As a matter of fact, on your way there, let's stop off at 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Those of you who are men, or you are males, I want you to say amen. amen. I didn't hear that, it kind of soft. We're going to take care of the women, don't worry. But today we're taking care of the men. Can I hear you say amen, brothers? Amen. Glory to God. First Timothy chapter 3. What you're going to read may hurt a little bit. But they say the truth sets you free. Look at verse 4. A man must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. Hello, men. It did not say boss. It said manage. He must manage his family well and get proper respect from his children. You know, there's a failure to clarify the husband and wife's role in a relationship. And this is one of the major causes of marital disruption and conflicts. If, we, if you get married, or those of you who are married, you will find that you are involved in an almost endless number of activities, responsibilities, and decisions. And every couple should discuss together and decide what the scripture says about that relationship and work it according to the word of God. It is imperative that couples deliberately and mutually develop the rules and guidelines of their relationship as husband and wife based on the word of God. If you don't, you run into problems. What's the woman's place in the home? There are four basic positions that women seem to fall into depending on the knowledge that the family has. The first one is property. Some wives has almo have almost no rights. They don't have any privileges compared to those of their husband. The husband is the family provider. And often the wife is merely a chattel for the husband's sexual appetite. When a woman is seen as property, then you are in a danger zone. The first chapter of Genesis says that God made man and woman in his own image. In the image of God created he them, male and female. You don't treat God's property as yours. It's his. You don't treat his image as your property. It's not yours. It's his. One time the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus and they said to him, they said, Master, should we pay tithes 
or taxes to Caesar or not. He said, look, give me a penny. And they gave him a penny. And he said, whose image is on that? They say, Caesar. Say, okay, give to Caesar what has his image on it. And to God what has his on it. What has God's image on it? You. You and me. I belong to God. So you wives, the next time a man raises his hands at you, block it. <laughs> and just say to him, sir, I belong to God. And if you hit me one more time, crazy to see that is in me. <laughs> than he that is in the world and apparently you are in the world be careful some men see women as property second way some men see women is simply as a compliment to them that's wrong as well this is when the wife's rights have increased a little bit but marriage is the wife's central interest husband is chief provider has more authority than wife she is a friend to her husband he achieves and she supports him as he achieves in other words she assists him in his success she's only there to be a compliment if he wants to go to college she works and pays for it hello <laughs> she's just there to compliment me that's where we get the saying behind every good man why behind <laughs> you know tails are usually behind and the scripture says every believer is not the head is that what it says the Bible says every believer is the head not the tail my wife's not supposed to be behind me. Behind every good man is his hip. <laughs> What's so funny? That's what we really need to learn. Behind me is not my wife. Beside me is my wife. The Bible gave both of us. Genesis 1.26 says, God said unto them, have dominion and dominate. Both of them. And she doesn't dominate by peeping from behind me. We dominate together. Lord have mercy. The third way that men see women, how about this one? If they're not a compliment, then they get promoted to junior partner. <laughs> you know what a junior partner is? The wife's rights increases a little bit more because she works outside the home for pay. However, her main motive is to improve the family's lifestyle. She has more authority than a non-working woman. But she only works to assist. And that's serious. Nowadays, when women are shouting for their rights and wanting to be equal and want to have the same treatment as men, etc., etc., people are getting this philosophy all mixed up. Do you know that the, the Equal Rights Amendment is really old stuff to God? In the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and I always refer there because that's God's perfect will he made both of them in his image both of them in his likeness and he said to both of them be fruitful and multiply subdue and dominate the earth to both of them they were equal in their relationship to God and their authority in the earth 
Some people say, yeah, but I don't believe that, Brother Miles. God said that the woman is second. He didn't say that. Well, it's somewhere in the concordance. I know. In the book of Concordance, chapter 2, you can find it right there. That's the only place you really find it. Sin caused the disruption in that authority. Yeah, but I still don't believe that women should be the head. I didn't say she was the head. But I still don't believe women should boss men. I didn't say she should boss a man. I think a woman's place is in the home. Then send your wife home. If you believe the woman's place is in the home, then you need to take the last chapter of Proverbs, tear it out and burn it up. Because the woman in the last chapter of Proverbs was a real estate agent. She owned a, a clothing store, a material factory. <laughs> and she was well known in the gates because her husband bragged about it. It's interesting, isn't it? Where do, we, where do these ministers get this strange idea that a woman should keep quiet in the church? You know, if the women kept quiet in the church, there'll be no singing, no choir, no nothing. Because the men don't sing. <laughs> Good Lord. Women, please don't keep quiet in here. Please. But here's something interesting. If you believe that God has a a problem with women and that he believes they are second-class subhumans then tell me why Jesus says this in the new Jerusalem in the new kingdom of God there are no marriages nor given in marriages for everyone is the same well glory I mean brother if you believe that women are not the same before God and they are not one in union with God and their authority is not the same then you won't make it in heaven too well praise God for women I wouldn't be here but there wasn't any there's a final way that men see women and this is the way Jesus saw them and it is as equal partner. Equal partner. Wife and husband share equal rights and responsibilities in life and in ministry. How sad it is when we get to the point where we begin to treat our mates as if they are not total human beings. What does the word of God say concerning the man? Ephesians chapter 5. This is where we really get into the real purpose of a man's relationship to his wife. And this is going to help you young men who are not married yet. This is going to help you look in the mirror and ask yourself if you're ready for marriage. And those of you who are married, you're going to be glad you came this morning. Or sorry. Verse 22, Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife as... It did not a period after that head. A lot of men just read that and then cut off the rest. The husband is head of the wife as Christ is head of the church. That's the only way the husband is head of the wife. Only as Christ is head of the church. So men, if you want to know how you are supposed to be head of the wife, you've got to learn how Christ is head of the church. You can't be the head of the wife until you first learn how Christ is head of the church. If you haven't learned that, don't try to be the head of your wife. 
That means you got to come before the Lord, get filled with His Spirit so He could teach you how Christ is head of the church. Then you need to get into a good church where they teach the Word of God so you can learn how Christ is head of the church. Then you will be able to become head of your wife as Christ is head of the church. It says here, wives submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Did you get that? The wife submits. The word submission means a will to yield to another's authority. It also means to commit your will to another to permit another's authority to become yours. That's what it means to submit. Submission is 100% the choice of the wife. It has nothing to do with the husband. Whenever a man has to command submission, he doesn't deserve it. If you have to order your wife to obey you, then you are out from under God's authority. You don't deserve for her to obey you. Whenever a man has to lift his hands to a woman, that man does not deserve a wife. Under God, submission is an act of the will of the one who submits. And the scripture says the only wife who submits is the one who is married to a man, verse 22, who acts like the Lord. Submit to your husband as you submit to the Lord. When you see the Lord in him, you submit. That's what you're looking for. So brothers, we got a tough job. Men, our job is to keep making sure our wife sees Jesus. Always checking to make sure she sees Jesus. Because when she don't, she have no right to cook. No obligation to clean clothes. No obligation to love and to kiss and to care. She's supposed to look for God in you. Could you imagine Jesus cursing her? Could you imagine Jesus slapping her? Could you imagine Jesus kicking her? Could you imagine Jesus commanding her to commit unnatural sex acts? Could you imagine Jesus encouraging her to go get stoned? Could you imagine Jesus enticing her to snort coke? What else do we do that we think Jesus will do? And then yet we want them to submit. God says no. Could you imagine Jesus walking up to her and telling her, go buy me some Dubonnet, I want to get stoned. Here. Can you imagine Jesus walking up to this wife and say, get me some cigarettes, let me destroy my lungs. Would Jesus do those things? And yet we want submission? A woman submits to Christ because he loves her so much. Even a man submits to Christ because of his love. If a man have to force a woman to do anything, then that man is no longer the head. He becomes the boss. Does Jesus force you to do anything? Anybody? Does he? Does Jesus force you to do anything? No, he doesn't. He uses words like, whosoever will. Oh, that is so open-ended. Now he says, just how Christ loved us, so are we to love our wives. How did he love us? Whosoever will. You go to your wife and you say, if you would like to iron my shirts, fine. <laughs> That's what you're saying? If you would like to cook for me, fine. Man, that's heavy. It means you would really have to really be so lovable that she would do it with the whosoever spirit. 
she would wash your clothes because she likes the way you are. That's why we serve Jesus. We love the way he is. We spend hours sitting here worshiping him and listening to him talk. Why? Because we love him. We would change our lifestyles and refuse certain friends. Why? Because we love him. Who are we? The church. Who's the church? The bride of Christ. Who is Christ? The husbandman, the bridegroom. And we do everything for him with the whosoever spirit. If you would like to go to hell, Jesus will protect your right to go. But if you would like to go to heaven, he'll give you the right to go. Either way, it's up to you. It's a point of submission. So you're the wife's husband, are you? And I wonder if she deserves the picture you're showing her. Wouldn't it be great if your little boy woke up in the morning and says, Daddy, you remind me of God. Oh, wouldn't that be a dream come true? If your wife looks over at you from the breakfast table and she says, Honey, if I ever saw Jesus, he's having breakfast with me. Perhaps you men should write that down as a goal in your life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay alive until I hear my wife say that. <laughs> I am going to do everything in my power until I hear my wife say that. When I see you, I see Jesus. That's who they're looking for. Look at verse 24. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to their husbands. Is that the way you are submitting? Just like the church submits to Christ? Now it reverses it. It says, husbands, if you want wives submit to you, act like God. Be like the Lord. Wives, submit to your husbands who look like God, like the church submits to Christ. So wives, if you don't know how to submit, then you have to get born again through the Holy Spirit and come to a good church where you can learn how the church submits to Christ. The church does not submit to Christ out of fear. Have you noticed? There are people who come to God because they're scared of hell. So they get saved for fire insurance. <laughs> That's not a good reason to get saved. Because if you do, then you find yourself living the rest of your life in fear. So you're only following God because of a result that you want, rather than loving him for who he is. Jesus, one time... He had 120 disciples following him, and they were all shouting, Hosanna, they were excited about him, they were clapping him everywhere he went, they were bragging on him. One day he just stopped. He turned around, he said, shut up. Didn't quite say it like that, but that's what he meant. He says, now, if any of you want to follow me, first, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. He said, I fed you in the wilderness. I gave you fish to eat and bread two days ago. And many of you are following me because of your fish sandwich. He said, but except you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you cannot be my disciples. The Bible says, all of them forsook him except the twelve. A hundred and twenty, only twelve left? And the scripture says, and they said unto him, this is a hard saying. <laughs> and they left him. What was he after? Don't follow me because of blessings. Don't follow me because you're afraid of hell. Don't follow me because you want to go to heaven. 
He says, follow me because you love me. And took it a little further. He says, for if you love me, you'll keep my commands. Not if you're afraid of me. Not if you're afraid of hell. But if you love me, you will keep my commands. Praise God. Wives, that's the way Jesus wants the church to submit to him. Now let's transfer it then. That's what the Bible says to do. So the husband then wants the wife to submit to him not because he threatens her with divorce. Not because he says, I'll leave you if you don't. Not because he says, I'll stop supporting the children. God doesn't want the husband to get submission because he takes up his hands and threatens to hit her. He desires her to submit because she loves him. What have you done for her to love you? What have you shown your wife for her to love you? Some wives are afraid when the husband pulls in the garage. I mean, they take in with the nerves. I've had counseling sessions where wives were afraid to go home. They would come to my office for counseling and we'd finish and I'd say, okay, you know, you may leave now. She says, I'm afraid to go home. Why? But I know he's going to beat me again. <laughs> and then that husband won. Husbands, how are you supposed to love that woman? Like Christ loved the church. The question is, how does Christ love the church? That's the question. You don't know how to love your wife according to the Bible. You don't know how to love your wife until you learn how Christ loves the church. Everything else is just fumbling. You love her like Hollywood movies. You love her like Mills and Bones books. You love her like teen magazine. You love her like true romance stories in these flimsy magazines. You love her like some story you read in some novel. You love her like your, your buddy told you he loved his. You see, we learn everything else except the way Jesus loved the church. So all we can do is what we learn, and what we learn is from Dallas. And you know where Dallas go? You change beds every night. And we wonder why we have problems. How sad. This situation is simply because we don't know how to love them. I was sharing with a wife not too long ago. I said, honey, she says, I don't know what's wrong with this man. I do everything I can. I have bent over backwards. I have tried everything to please him. And yet still he abuses me. She said, what else can I do? I said, do you know something? It is very common to run into cases where a person do not know how to love. No matter what you do, you kiss them, buy them presents, whatever, they still curse you. They don't know how to love. They were brought up in a situation probably where they didn't even see love. So no matter how you treat them, what you give them, how you talk to them, how well you make them feel, they still curse you. Because they don't have the, the material to give you what you want. They don't know how to love you. Sometimes you wonder, a woman will do, a woman will do, and then he still be there. And you're wondering why. It's because he probably doesn't know how. And what I am sharing with you in this series is that there is a way to know how. And the way you do it is to find out how did Jesus love the church? And then you got your pattern for loving your wife. It gives us a hint, first of all, in verse 25. Husband, love your wives just like Christ loved the church. How? By giving himself first for her. Glory. <laughs> you got to get to the point where you lose yourself to bless her. Giving up himself, Jesus said, except a man deny himself, he cannot even understand the kingdom of God. 
to deny yourself doesn't, doesn't mean that you go die on the cross for your wife. It doesn't mean that you jump in the front of a car and get hit instead of her. To deny yourself is the man. To deny yourself, he referred to denial one day when the disciples were talking about going to bury the dead, dead, or going to sell a farm, or going to feed the cow. He said, wait a minute. He said, if you go bury the dead, then you have no time for me. Let the dead bury the dead. What was he really trying to say? There are some things that you consider so important to you personally that you will have to deny for her. Some of you men, for example, may have been very versed, well versed in sports. And you grew up in playing basketball all your life. Then you got married. Honey, basketball games finished. You used to go out every evening shooting balls with your buddies. Every your buddy, because you didn't have a wife. You used to go down to the park and play baseball all day, swinging bats all day, all day with the boys. You used to sit down on the street corner under the big tambourine tree, and you'd be playing dominoes all day. Then you got married. You love basketball. You know the name of every player, and the Nuggets and the Lakers. You know all of the averages and everything. You got it down to the details. Then someone asks you, do you know your wife? Well, I know OJ. I know Kareem. Do you know Karen? I know how much money Kareem makes. I know how much chairs he got in his house. How? Do you know your wife? I know the batting average, man. Well, the New York Yankees, New York Yankees, do you know your wife? Do you know your own batting average? <laughs> we got problems, don't we? So what you got to do, you got to deny yourself. When you get married, your wife, go to the food store, food store. To shop with her. And as soon as she wants to go, the World Series comes on. And you got it like this. I'm coming right now, right now. I'm on a <laughs> Coming right now, woman. Shut up. Wait. Coming right now. Get him! Get him! Shut up, lady. Woman, if you can't, woman, if you can't wait, go. It's the attitude, isn't it? I will not deny my baseball. I deny you. Go. I will not lay down my life. For you, I lay it down for baseball. <laughs> Bible says Jesus loved the church first by laying down his life. The husband of the wife, how you doing? Do the boys see you more than her? Oh, there's so much to learn. <clears throat> Next week, I am going to give you a list of ways Jesus loved the church. And uh, what I am going to do is have them printed up. And I'm going to give it to every wife. All right, I'm going to put a little box next to it so you can check it off. Okay, wives? And those of you who are courting, you get yours too. <laughs> those of you who are hoping to get in court, <laughs> you get yours too to put on file. And I want you to take that list of how Christ loved the church and I want you to take it home I want you to put it up on your mirror where you fix your hair so he could see it I want you to get a big black marker so you don't miss it 
And I want each man in this room to get a copy of it too. And I want him to put it up. And then I want you to start going down the list. And every time you see him measure up to one, you take it. When he finished the list, come get a new form. <laughs> start over again. And do it until Jesus comes. It'll take that long for him to really learn how to love like Jesus. But we, but we need to know practically how Jesus loved. How did Jesus deal with people who talked bad to him? How did he deal with people who were caught in sin? How did he love them? What did he do when people accused him and he knew it wasn't true? What did he do? Isn't that strange? He, he didn't do what we normally do. You know when someone accuses you, boy, you start rowing. Tell them. Jesus didn't do that. There's a way that he loved us. He says, now you love your wife the same way. I pray that this message rings out over this whole nation. In every home. That the men would stop faking it. That's what they're doing. I believe 90% of the men in this country do not know what a husband is. It's the honest truth. From my experience in dealing with the problems of marriage, they just don't know. No. I asked a question in a marriage seminar one time. I had all the men stand up. I said, all your stand up. And they stood up. I said, now, I want all of you men to love your wife. <laughs> and they did like this. <laughs> they didn't know what to do. They just, <laughs> they just got nervous. They didn't know. How do you love your wife? Half of them was thinking about sex. They call that love. If sex is love, then nobody's more loved than a prostitute. And they're the ones who commit the most suicides. You got problems. They don't know. They don't know how to love their wives. What are you, what are you supposed to do? How do you love a wife? That's what we need to learn. And the Bible teaches us how to do it. Just like Christ loved the church. And that's what we're going to deal with next week. How to love, love women in God. And when we start teaching about the women, we can teach you how to honor your husband. There's a way to do it. And you women don't get carried away now. 90% of you all don't know how to honor your husband. Not because you don't want to, it's just that you don't know. And you can't do what you don't know. Some women believe that you honor your husband by going to bed with him every time they desire it. That's not honoring. No. There's a way that the church honors Jesus. And it's in the Bible. And we got to learn it. And that's how we honor the husband. I thank God for the word of God. Let me close with this passage here. Husband, love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. How? It says, and cleansed her and made her holy by the washing of water, which is the word. Underline that, man. That's heavy stuff. It says, husband, here's the way Christ loved the church. First, he denied himself, gave himself up for it. Secondly, he kept, him, he kept his church clean and continues to do so by teaching her the word. Be right back to where we started. How is the husband supposed to cleanse the wife? By the washing of water by the word. How is the husband supposed to sanctify the wife? By the washing of water. How is the husband supposed to, to make the wife holy? By the washing of water by the word. 
You don't make your wife holy by buying a minx. You don't make her holy by taking at expensive dinner parties. You don't make her holy by buying her dresses and cars. The Bible says you make your wife holy by cleansing her with the word of God. Wow. What God is really saying here is you are qualified for a wife when you are able to teach her the word. If you can't teach her, you're not ready yet. If you don't know anything about the word of the Lord, don't get married yet. That's the qualification for a good husband. If you want to be like Jesus, then you have to get the word so you can wash your wife down. I did some word studies here in this passage in the, in the Greek. And it's a strange thing, this cleansing thing. The word cleansing is, a, is an infinitive tense. Clean is a one-time job. Cleansing is a continual job. Continual. So if I clean my car, that's an event. I do it and I stop. If I cleanse my car, what I actually do is put my car under a waterfall and leave it there forever. That's what cleansing is. Cleansing is a continual washing. Washing. Never stop. Washing. Now it doesn't say clean your wife. Oh glory. That means you don't just clean her once and then she's on her own. Husbands, you gotta get you gotta get all that coming out of you. You've gotta get filled with the word that constantly you are reminding your family about the word. The word says this, the word says that, the word says do this, the word says don't do that, it says don't says this, the word says that. When your wife comes in the house and she says, Oh Lord, honey, we got a Lord, honey, we got a big mortgage bill. Oh, what are we gonna do? You say, woman, our God shall supply all of our needs according to His glory. You wash her off. She comes and she says, the baby's sick, he's gonna die. Man, that's a negative thing. Wash her right away. Without spot, it says, or wrinkle. That's a spot of shout. Word. The word says, I am the Lord that God that He Lord thee. You keep your family under the flood. Your family will stay clean. When your children come into the house and says, Daddy, the brothers outside mistreated me. You wash your son. So Jesus said, do good to them that despitefully use you. You wash your children. What does that mean? That means, men, you've got to get in a position where you can get the word of God so that you can cleanse your wife. Most men cleanse their wives with falcon crest philosophy. That's all they watch. They cleanse their wives with barroom stories. That's where they spend their fellowship. They watch their wives with some other buddy's experience with their wife. It's ungodly. You wash your wife with the washing of water by the word of God. Jesus said in John 17, you are clean through the words I have spoken unto you. There's a washing process in the word. Praise God. The washing process. The word is like cleansing agents. So if you want to be a good husband of your wife, then get yourself filled with Holy Ghost detergent. That's the word of God. Amen. <laughs> Stay in the Word. Read good books that teach you principles from God's Word. And listen to good tapes where you can feed your spirit the right kind of information. And read the Bible back to back. Read it, read it. Don't stop reading it. Get into all the different areas where you can receive more. Come to every seminar. Why? The more you get, the more you can wash. And I tell you, your family will be just like the church and Jesus strong in the face of all odds. This is God's will for his church. Now this morning we have so many of you here today. Some of you women have come from homes. I know you're sitting here and you're wishing that your husband was here. You know, you wish your husband was sitting right next to you, some of you who are married. You're probably saying to yourself, he should have been here to hear this. <laughs> Don't talk too fast. Perhaps you needed to hear it first. 
And those of you who are planning to get married, maybe you are engaged or you are looking forward to getting married. This guy, who can a guy who can't cleanse you? No matter how cool he looks, how fine he dresses, no matter how much Aramis he wears, it doesn't matter. When it's all over, make sure he can wash you. Because that's what you want. I pray today as we close that you, right where you are, even in the overflow room, those of you who have been hurting from relationships that have gone sour, a lot of it is simply because people don't know the word of God. And each one of us need to understand our responsibility. Men, I know, are kind of uncomfortable. That's good. That's my intention. Wonderful. If I cause you to cancel your engagement, good. Put it off later if you're not sure you can cleanse her. You women, if you plan to get married, and you're running headlong into it because you're excited, whoa, man. <laughs> Slow down. And don't ask questions like, can he provide for me? That's not the issue. Can he pay bills? That's not the issue. Can he show me God? That's the issue. Can he show me Jesus? If he can't show me Jesus, we're back to JR again. And that's the truth. That's the questions you ask. So you cool dudes who walk around real hip, watch it. Ask yourself a question. Can I wash this woman? Can I cleanse this young girl? If I can't, then I'm going to stay away from her until I get the word. I'm going to keep my relationships on God's healthy avenue. Paul says, young men, treat the young women as sisters. And young women, treat the young men as brothers. It's in the book of Timothy. That's the way we see them. You don't see them as your potential wife. They're your sister. Take your sister out for lunch. lunch. That's all. And sister, please don't think he can marry you if he take you out for lunch. <laughs> Some people are so lightheaded, you know. He asked me out. <laughs> uh, uh, it's foolishness. It's foolishness. <laughs> Man, the guy may just want fellowship with his sister in the Lord. You know? And you know, girls, it's funny. My sisters ask me to do things. You know, my sisters ask me to come to their house for dinner and come, they take me out. You know? My sisters do that. So don't sit down and wait for him to come all the time. Go to him. Say, Johnny, I want to take you out for lunch. Let's go. Go. It's a woman asking the man. Why? It's my, it's my brother. Take your brother out. No ulterior motives, nothing hidden, for no reason except you are God's image and I love you. I love you. But some girls are lighthearted, boy. They go walking around. <laughs> he loves me. Oh, he loves me. <laughs> they go home and tell the whole neighborhood, he loves me. All he did was, ate, he ate Kong Chado with you. That's all he did. He just want to be a friend. But remember, look for the image of Jesus. That's what you look for. Let's hold hands with our brothers and sisters. Oh, wonderful Father. I pray now for those in this auditorium and in the overflow room here. I pray for everyone that touches another. 
the things that we have heard have caused our hearts to burn within us. For when you reveal your truth, that always happens. Our heart just burns. The truth sets us free. Father, it is my desire to be the best husband in the world. And you know my heart. It's my desire to see the same in the lives of your church and your people. But more than mine or theirs, it is your desire that they have successful homes and marriages relationships. I pray that your word today would cause us to live a different kind of life this week and we would really think seriously about what you have said to us and that we would make those adjustments, those commitments, those commitments and those changes where they are necessary. Forgive us, O Lord, today for the times when they could not see Jesus. They saw us. They saw the old man. Forgive us, Father. And may we from this moment cry, this moment cry like Paul. I live, yet not I, but it is Christ who lives in me. May we be able to say like you, Jesus, he that have seen me have seen Jesus. Make this, Lord, the prayer of every male in this room, every teenage man, every unmarried adult man, every divorced man, every married man, Lord, I pray for them. Something new is beginning in this country, and you're doing it, Lord, one at a time, slowly but surely. You are teaching us what we always wanted to know. And we all need you the same way. I pray for the women here, Lord, those who have been suffering under ignorant husbands, men who are abusive with their language and, and their attitudes, even physically abusive. Lord, I pray that you would forgive them. I pray that that wife would release that husband away from her bitterness and she would give up that bitterness and forgive him and let him go. Let him go into the grace of God by freeing him from her bitterness. And I pray that your forgiveness would enter her heart. I also pray and I speak the word. The word would go forth and convict him right now. Wherever he is, if he is not here, Lord, your word, I send it forth in the name of Jesus Christ to convict him of sin, righteousness, and judgment, just like you promised the Holy Spirit would. Wherever he is, Lord, in the home, with friends, watching TV, playing games, or whatever, Lord, I send your word right now. Stir him up, Lord. And Father, when he hears the word, be it on television, or through a friend, or through a tract, May the prayer that we pray today cause him to respond to the word he reads or says and hears. And we shall see changed lives because changed hearts make changed lives. Thank you for healing the homes, Lord. The wise here have hope. Praise God. There's good things ahead for these families. No matter how it looks, the devil's days are numbered because the knowledge of God is in the earth. And when the truth comes, it sets us free. Let not that wife give up. Let not that husband give up. Let us all know that we are responsible to you. Oh, we're so thankful for your presence. Hallelujah. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.